right now it's an honor to introduce my friend, our senior pastor, Curtis J. Wright Sr. And we always like it when he's standing in his pulpit. Welcome to Desert Hot Springs Seventh-day Adventist Church, Pastor Wright. Amen. 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 As I reflect on the training I received concerning these matters, we were taught to spend 30 hours preparing the sermon and 45 minutes in the delivery. And as I look at the clock, it's 11.45 right now, and I think in terms of the church culture of this church, a thought came to my mind. Uh, I remember learning how to tell time, and I was at church one Sabbath. There was no baptism, no communion, and we got out at 3.30 in the afternoon, starting at 11. So you have a multiple choice. We can go on till 3.30 today, or those of you that would like to leave by 12 can leave now. Amen. Lord, as we open your word, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, that we may benefit and be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. When I think of the topic of today's sermon, Christian education, there are some options, thank you, options that come to mind. The first one that I reflected on as the children were delivering the funding for Christian education. What does it mean is the interrogative that came to my mind. What does it mean to train up a child? Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they should not depart from it. So my question to myself, what does it mean to train up a child? As I begin thinking in terms of the answer, my first response is, training up a child is directing them to Jesus. Yes. If you take a moment and look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, it has something to say about this. Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm looking at the words of Moses, the thoughts of God spoken to Moses, and Moses is communicating these thoughts in Deuteronomy 6 thoughts that are not his thoughts, but thoughts from God. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgment with the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye may do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and commandments which I command thee, thou, and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, 
and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up teach them diligently unto thy children Isaiah 54 13 reminds us that they all should be taught of God Colossians has something interesting to say. Verse 21 of chapter 3. To fathers and mothers, provoke not thy children to wrath. In a book called Education, in chapter 6, there's a topic called the schools of the prophets. Sacred history presents many examples of the result of Christian education, examples of individuals whose characters are formed under divine direction, what we know as religious education, individuals whose lives were a blessing to others, individuals who stood among the people as representatives of God, as a result of their religious training. People like Esther, people like Joseph, Daniel, Moses, and many others. As a young shepherd boy, Joseph tended his father's flocks like his brothers did. His pure and simple lifestyle developed his physical and intellectual strength and by communion with God and nature, by studying the great truths handed down as a sacred trust from father to son, Joseph gained strength of mind and firmness in character. He accepted the religious education that he received. He applied the religious training that he was given. And in the crises of life, Joseph remembered his father's God. He remembered the lessons of his childhood education. Joseph thrilled as he resolved to prove himself true. He chose to honor the king of heaven. Genesis 49 reveals the secret of Joseph's life. In Genesis 49, we find Jacob, his father, blessing his 12 sons. And his blessing to Joseph in Genesis 49, beginning with verse 22, reveals the secret of Joseph's life. Loyalty to God. Faith in the unseen was Joseph's anchor. Chapter 49. Verse 22, his father said, Joseph is a fruitful bough. Even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with the blessings of heaven, blessings of the deep that lie under thee, blessings of the blessing of the womb, blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brothers. This was the source of Joseph's power. 
By not rejecting the religious education, the arms of his hands are made strong by the almighty hands of the God of Jacob. The greatest want of the world today is the want of men and women who will not be bought or sold. Men and women who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men and women who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men and women whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men and women who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Today, stand for what is right though the heavens fall. Moses, in his early childhood education, his religious education proved to be a benefit to him for the rest of his life. Such a character is not the result of an accident. It is not due to the special favors given by God, special endowments. A noble character is the result of self-discipline and the subjection of the lower to the higher nature and the surrender of self for service of love to God and man. Christian education is Christ-centered education. Christ-centered education for the young and for the old. Amen. It's never too late for adult education classes. Amen. Moses was involved in the re-education of the people of God in Exodus 20. He reminds us of our children's story today when he said, remember the Sabbath day. Remember what you were taught. Remember. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul warns about false education. Take a moment and look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy sons, nor thy daughters, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What does Paul say in 2 Timothy chapter 2 concerning false education? Beginning with verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for the masteries and be not crowned, except he strive lawfully, the husbandman that laboreth must be the first partaker of the fruits. Did you know that sometimes God gives us what we ask for? Sometimes God gives us what we want. Amen. Sometimes God gives us what we choose, what we demand, what we insist on, even if it's not for our good. 2 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel 8 reminds us Israel wanted a king in 1 Samuel 8. They had pretty good intentions. The sons of Samuel were renegades, rebels, disloyal to God, and they were in leadership. And they said, well, these guys aren't good examples. We want a king like the other nations. But when we turn from God, when we turn from Christ-centered education, we find ourselves on shaky ground. And God gave them a king. But he said to Samuel, 
Don't try to persuade them to change their mind. Let them have what they're asking for. But tell them that that king's going to take their daughters and make cooks and servants out of them. They'll take the sons and send them to battle. They'll take your children and make slaves out of them. But you'll get what you ask for. And we in our day and age get what we ask for most of the time. But Jesus offers us continuing education classes. Amen. For everyday living and for everybody. You find it in Matthew 11, verse 28, 29, and 30. Matthew 11 talks about this continuing education, adult education, early childhood education for anyone and everyone. Matthew, what chapter? 11. 11, what verses? 28 and 29. It is now 12 o'clock, <laughs> and all ye saints may leave if you so desire. Oh, that's not what it says. It says, come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Praise the Lord. Who is this talking here? Come unto me, take my yoke, Jesus and Christ learn of me. In my Bible, those words are outlined in red meaning that they are the words of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, 6 puts it a different way. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. If you want rest for your mind, rest for your body, turn to Jesus, Amen. the Wonderful Counselor, Amen. the Mighty God. Turn to the Prince of Peace. Some people are accepting substitutes mm -hmm. for Jesus. They turn away from the Wonderful Counselor. Freud, in his psychoanalysis, Adler in his individual psychology, John, in his analytical psychology, right in his veggie toe therapy, <laughs> right with his will therapy, Sullivan in his interpersonal relationships, Rogers in his client centered therapy, Lowen in his bioenergetic therapy, Ellis in his rational emotive therapy, Glasser in his reality therapy, and all the others put together cannot, cannot outthink God. Amen. They cannot outthink the one that created our brains. Amen. All of them put together, doing their best, cannot heal the brokenhearted. Amen. God is the one that heals the brokenhearted. Look at what it says further in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 3. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. This is quite a passage because Jesus himself even quotes words from this passage. Isaiah 61. 1 to 3, and we're talking about Christian education today. And Isaiah said, speaking of Jesus, the Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me 
to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance from our God, to comfort all that mourn, He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. This man quoted from the book of Isaiah in Luke chapter 4. We find the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. And the narrative begins with verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him a book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He called me to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down in the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue, were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears and all bear witness of him and wonder about the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And then they said, wait a minute. We know who he is. This is Joseph's son. We know him. And Jesus had to say what he was thinking. The prophet's not even accepted, especially in his own hometown. <clears throat> Despised, rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. First Peter 5 7 says, In spite of all that, cast your cares on him Amen. because he cares for you. Hallelujah. There are many effective counselors doing great work. But remember, the wonderful counselor is the best the most effective of all. The measure of Christian counselors is measured by the degree in which he or she can put the client in touch with the wonderful counselor. 2 Corinthians 5 reminds us, if any man or woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creature. Did you know that God has provided Healing for our body, Amen. healing for our mind, Amen. healing for our spirit. Amen. He provided nutrition, mm -hmm. exercise, water, mm -hmm. sunlight, temperance, rest, trust in God. Amen. The book Ministry of Healing puts it this way. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. <sighs> Some pretty sound advice. Yeah. True remedies, but Satan wants to separate us from what is true. Satan wants to divert our minds from a thoughtful hour each day spent in contemplation with the life of Christ through Bible reading and prayer. He wants to distract us to the point where we don't lean on Jesus anymore. He wants us to cease to rely on him. He wants us to stop learning and growing. He knows the prayer of faith is the great strength of the Christian. If he can get us to neglect prayer and Bible study and to rely on our own strength, he knows that he can destroy us. But Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Jesus 
is the rock of my salvation. Jesus is the strength of my life. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And as we become educated in God's holy word, prayerfully studying and prayerfully applying, we find a shield against the fiery darts of Satan. And we can become conquerors not because of our own strength, not because of our own insight, but because of the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And as we bask in the sufficiency of Christ, we begin to understand our own insufficiency. We are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. We need one another. No one is an island. No one stands alone. Each man's joy is joy to me. Each man's grief is my own. Colossians 3 puts it a different way. Let the word of Christ de develop and dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, Amen. giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. The enemy would rather us not be educated or informed or knowledgeable or academic. He wants us to be misguided, mm -hmm. uneducated, misinformed concerning truth. Mm -hmm. John 17, 17 tells us where we get truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. Amen. And the light became the life of men. And the word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us. Jesus, the word, John 14 and 6, Jesus is talking once again, it's outlined in red, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. But Satan wants to conceal Jesus. Amen. He doesn't want Jesus to be central in our lives. Revelation 14 reminds us to worship him that made the heavens and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. Zephaniah warned against those that worship the stars and the moon and the, the galaxies. Paganism and false worship are condemned in Zephaniah chapter 1. Jeremiah 23 reminds us that God wants the remnant of the flock to be gathered, not scattered. Are you educated concerning the remnant? Are you informed? Are you knowledgeable? A young woman who has read remnant literature comes to Sabbath worship. No one speaks to her. No one asks her name. No one talks to her except the saint that sneers at the dangling pearls around her neck. Are you knowledgeable about the remnant church? A minister that I know was arrested. Minister in the remnant church arrested for burning down the church to collect insurance money. A 12 year old repeatedly dragged into bed by her remnant church father while her remnant church mother does nothing. A young woman burns with hatred toward the remnant. Her father, head elder, Sabbath school teacher, youth leader, beats his wife, then goes out to give Bible studies. A 
teacher at the ribbon of church school, found in bed with another man's wife, and the man so angry strangles him. A remnant church member opens his motorcycle dealership on Saturday. Parents torture themselves with remorse after years of sacrifice to send their children to remnant schools and they see all of their children renounce the remnant faith. Did you know that from the beginning, as a scattered fledgling group left over from the Millerites, Sabbath keepers have referred to themselves as the remnant. In 1849, Joseph Bates used the term found in Revelation 12, 17, and he described Adventists as the remnant. In 1853, Ellen White referred to Sabbath keeping Adventists as the remnant people of God. God's purpose is to reveal. Satan's purpose is to conceal. The book of Revelation is the book of revealing. Yes, it reveals Jesus. It reveals events that we're living through right now as we speak. It reveals future events which are coming. Revelation 12, 17 reminds us there's a war going on. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon did not prevail. It was cast out. So you ask the question, how can a movement troubled with turmoil and bickering be the remnant? Remember, we're in a war zone. How can a cold, dead, asleep church be the remnant church? Or one filled with legalism and worldliness, adultery, sexual misconduct. We're on a battlefield. <clears throat> what about church that doesn't live up to its standards? Can that church be the remnant? We bear battle scars that are real. What about a church that makes standards a religion, arguing with one another over almost every doctrine? Can a church body that neglects prophetic guidance be a remnant? We're fighting the fight of faith. The word of God weeps. The scriptures weep with the failing heresies and apostasies in the Old Testament remnant people. Corruption, bickering, compromise, adultery, legalism, hypocrisy, all existed in the Old Testament remnant of past ages, just like they exist today in Christian churches. Revelation chapter 3 has a message to the Laodiceans. This message applies to the people of God today, which applies to God's remnant. Laodicea is a movement that lacks holiness. But bear in mind, things will get worse for the people of God. We must get ready for what is to come. Satan knows that if we sleep a little longer, our destruction is certain. In Book Spiritual Gifts, 4B, page 45, we read, I was shown the low estate of God's people, that God had not departed from them, but they had departed from God and had become lukewarm. As we near the close of time, Satan comes down with great power, knowing that his time is short, especially on the remnant, his power will be exercised Ellen White is not writing to the Baptists. She's not writing to the Catholics. She's not writing to the Methodists. She's not writing to the Anglicans. She's writing to Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. Amen. Who can deny that we all make terrible mistakes as we turn away from looking steadfastly unto Jesus? Remember, it's Christ. Not the Adventist church that came down from heaven and died. Christ died for our sins. Christ offers his 
perfect righteousness on our behalf. He alone, not any church, saves. Amen. Jesus Amen. saves. Amen. He alone can save us. Not the pastor, not the Sabbath school teacher, not the conference evangelist, not the school principal, not the church elders, not even the general conference president. Only Jesus Amen. can save. Amen. But you remember your experience and you say, I've been burned by the church. I got a bad deal. So did Uriah, the Hittite, when the leader of the remnant church slept with his wife, then had him murdered. That's a bad deal. Well, you've been hurt by the people of God that should have known better. So was Naboth. He was killed by a queen of the remnant church. She wanted his beautiful vineyard for her own husband. Had a hitman kill him. You've been sickened by injustice and hypocrisy and the sins of professed Sabbath keepers? So was Isaiah. He wrote a whole book about it. You've been treated unjustly by church leaders. So was Jesus. Amen. Amen. The church leaders. Put him on a cross. The enemy who hates the church is seeking to drive people away. Some of his most effective agents are church members and church leaders themselves. The truth is not a church, it's not a building. The church might know the truth, but the truth is not the church. Jesus is the truth. Amen. Jesus is the life. Amen. Stick with Jesus. Amen. John, in the very back, 1 John chapter 2, says here is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is the remnant. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one for another. We're the people of God, called by his name, called from the dark, delivered from shame. One holy race, saints everyone, because of the blood of Christ. Jesus, the Son, we are the remnant. We are his people, the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving Amen. and into his court with praise. Amen. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Amen. Amen. Here is the patience of the saints. Amen. Amen.